Hello class and welcome to our last chapter of business statistics on multiple regression. So uh, we talked about linear regression in chapters 4 and 14 and then this week we are taking it to another level um, using multiple regression where basically in our previous formulas we had our predicted y would be equal to that intercept plus the slope times x, our predictor variable, right? But we only had one predictor variable. Under multiple regression, we could have uh, more predictor variables. We could have one more, or we could have a limitless number of predictor variables. So we could say, all right, well, maybe there's 10 things that affect this particular price of uh, an item we're selling, and all of these items affect it to this particular degree, okay? Now, in order to do the math here, we would either need to use matrix algebra, which is way beyond what was needed for this course from a math standpoint, just basic understanding of algebra. Um, so we're not going to be using matrix algebra. We are going to be sticking strictly to using software at this point and just understanding how these formulas work. Okay, so if you're given the numbers to plug in there, you can plug them in, but you aren't going to be doing the calculation to back into multiple items at the same time all by yourself. Okay, so um, looking at a simple regression example for home prices in relation to bedrooms in a house. Okay, we looked at this one way back in chapter four. They have a sample of 1,057 homes and they say, well, can bedrooms be used to predict the price of a house? Um, there's an appro uh, approximately linear relationship. Um, the equal spread violation is violated, which we can see by the, um, the box spreads. So we wanna be cautious about using inferential methods with this, okay? Now, what we see when we look at this and we run this through um, something like StatCrunch or another statistical software, we're going to get an output that looks like this, okay? And we, we talked about these outputs a little bit in, um, in the last chapter. And here we've got bedrooms, which is our, our X variables on the bottom here, and then the Y variables are on the top, all right? So what we look at though here, what's key, this R squared value, if you remember, this is um, how much of the variability of the price is accounted for by this model, is this R squared number here, all right? And only 21% of the variation in the price of our houses is accounted for by the number of bedrooms. So maybe there's some other factors that will pull into this. I mean, think about what is included in a house, like is there a garage, how many bathrooms are there, how many square feet are there? Um, what size is the lot? Where is it located? There's all these different things that will go into the price of a house. Because think about it, if only the price, uh, if only the bedrooms went into the price, then you could just take like one reasonable sized bedroom and slice it in half into two ridiculously small bedrooms, and then suddenly the price of your house would, would be 100% change based solely on you taking existing square footage and cutting a bedroom in half. Well, in fact, you might actually decrease the price by doing that, right? Because like, if you have two bedrooms that are so small, people cannot barely even fit a bed in them, that might actually be worth less than a house that has like, you know, in order to add a bedroom, you might actually end up with, you know, two usable bedrooms and then two tiny unusable bedrooms instead of three usable bedrooms. So you could actually, you know, negatively affect the price. So, um, that's why it's not just the number of bedrooms that's gonna predict this, right? So if we look at this and then we add in the living area, so the square footage on there, suddenly our model, uh, our R squared up here goes up to 57.8%, all right? Um, and now it's, a compl it, it's looking at 58% of the variation in the price here, all right, which is a lot better. So, um, just looking at some other notes that I wanted to go through on here. Um, I'll keep rolling here. All right. Um, as I look at this slide here, though, I want to just discuss what some of the things are that we're going to want to know about here. All right. 
So if you remember the sum of squares of our residuals, um, it's a measure of dispersion, right? Um, so we've got that up there, the S. And then um, if you see a reference to MS, that's the mean square of the residuals, which is your variance, all right? And then um, the F value that you will see sometimes referred to is a ratio of the mean squares. But so when you're looking at this output here, all right, you've got your price. This is your Y variable here, all right? And you know what, I wonder, let's see, I don't have a, oh, I do have a pen here, okay. So let's see if I can write on this. So let me, and it will not, shoot, all right. Um, I'll just use the highlighter then, or the laser, the laser pointer. Hold on, let me see. Um, gonna pause for one second while I figure this out. Okay, I found one. Okay, so this is your Y variable here, all right? And then um, down here, you're gonna have, um, these are gonna be your various X variables on the bottom here, all right? And so when they're talking about intercept here, um, they're talking, this is gonna be your B zero on this line. Um, this is gonna be your B one, this is a B2 here. So, and, and you know, what order they're in, it doesn't matter whether this is one or two. It's just each section like this is going to be um, tied up to a coefficient up here for an X variable. And all your X variables are gonna be listed, you know, they could extend down here depending on how many of them you have, all right? Now, um, these, um, coefficients down here. Um, these are, this one is going to be your standard error here of your B0, all right? Your standard error here for B1 and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Um, your T ratio, so these are your, your T values here, all right? And then these are the corresponding P values that, um, that go along with each of these respective items, all right? So they're doing that math for you. You don't have to do that, all right? Then you notice up here, you've got your degrees of freedom. So what we can tell here when they say 1057 minus three equals 1054 degrees of freedom um, is that the 1057 is the number of data points that we had, right? Uh, so this is the um, percentage of the variation that is accounted for by the model, right? Um, and then this is your um, standard deviation here. Okay, so I just wanted to review all of that and you can see that all of that is um, incorporated, you know, um, these variables up here are incorporated into the statement of the regression. So the predicted price equals 28,986.10 minus 7483.1 bedrooms. Notice it's a minus because there's a negative up here, all right? And then this one is positive because there's not a negative. So there's normally not a negative here anywhere unless it's stated up here as a negative coefficient, okay? So keep that in mind too. Um, plus 93.84 times the living area, all right? So that's interpreting your multiple regression from a software which we, um, we walked through how to run those regressions last, well, we walked through how to do a simple regression. We'll see some examples of the multiple regressions in the in-class exercises here today. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna go back to my mouse, all right. Whoops, um, clear all those. So for um, our multiple regression, all right, you remember our residuals, okay? Residuals are those differences between what we actually see for a Y value at a particular value of X minus what we predicted for that to be, okay? So that's what we're seeing here is, um, is actual minus um, the predicted. 
Okay. And then for our degrees of freedom, then we are going to have um, N, so the number of items we had, minus the number of predictor variables, minus one. Okay, so in the last example that we were looking at back here, we had two predictor variables plus, minus the additional one. So two plus one is three. So N minus two minus one is what they have there. All right, and then the standard deviation of those residuals is calculated um, by taking the square root of the sum of the squared residuals um, divided by that n minus k minus one, which is our degrees of freedom. So if you're given some of these and they, we may have a problem, a problem where you have to calculate a um, standard deviation, all right? And, or what is the sum of squares of the residuals, okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, now, um, for each predictor variable, your regression output is gonna have a coefficient that will be plugged into your formula like we showed. Um, it's gonna have the standard error, the T-ratio, and the P-value. Now that T ratio, remember, we can use that as a measuring stick that says how many standard errors away uh, is our coefficient from zero. And then we can use the P value to test if each of those coefficients is different from zero, okay? Um, the meaning of these coefficients is a little bit different than in the simple regression because each coefficient takes into account the other predictors in the model. So if you were to completely remove one of those, then the coefficient of the others would change, okay? So if you had eight different items, eight different predictor variables that you had in there, and then you just deleted one of them, the result wouldn't then just be the same coefficients that were there previously, like on this one. If we removed this 93.84 living area here, the bedrooms coefficient, if we reran this, would no, would no longer be minus 74.8310. It would have to be recalculated without living area, okay? because it just, it, it changes how the model interacts with all the different pieces, all right? So just keep that in mind. You can't just pull one piece out and then have the numbers stay the same. It will, it will be incorrect. All right, so um, in our multiple regression, each coefficient is gonna, as I just said, take into account all the other predictors, all right? So when you have houses with similarly sized living areas, more bedrooms, means smaller bedrooms and or smaller common living space, right? So if you say have 3,000 square foot house, which is a pretty good sized house, um, but you just keep dividing it and you put it into eight bedrooms, right? Then you're gonna have a whole bunch of little tiny rooms, which could actually decrease the value of our house, which is why we have that negative um, coefficient on there as far as the price goes. Um, so do more bedrooms tend to increase or decrease the price of a home? If bedrooms is the only predictor, then yes, more bedrooms may mean a bigger house, typically, because most people aren't going to build a house with eight ridiculously tiny bedrooms. It just wouldn't, it, nobody would want it, right? So people will tend to build bedrooms that are of a more appropriate size. But if you have the same amount of living area, then price actually goes down if you increase the number of bedrooms because you're making the bedrooms get smaller and smaller within that fixed amount of space. So you actually have a, a, an inverse relationship there, all right, which is it's an interesting way of looking at how the math can work on these different problems and how you can't really assume that if a variable um, has a positive relationship um, with your response variable on its own that it will continue to do so when other factors are put into play, okay? So 
Uh, multiple regression coefficients have to be interpreted in terms of all the other predictors that are in your model, and they cannot be interpreted causally. So we don't assume a causation between our predictive variables and the response variable. It's an interrelationship, so to speak. All right, now um, let's talk about ticket prices. On a typical night in New York City, about 25,000 people attend a Broadway show paying an average price of more than $75 for each ticket. For most weeks of 2006 through 2008, consider the variables paid attendance, number of shows, average ticket price to predict the receipts, the dollars in receipts um, for all of these shows, okay? So here's a model showing these, um, showing the analysis here, all right? And um, they've got the sum of squares on here, which this was not shown in the earlier example, but um, that sum of squares that's shown here is a measurement of, of dispersion, okay? And the variance, so it's the average, uh, the variance is your average sum of your squares, okay? And then your mean square, um, is the mean square of your residuals, which is basically your variance. So, um, moving on with that then, and then I think I mentioned on the previous one that F value, that's a ratio of your mean squares. Okay. So we're going to we're going to write a regression model for all of these variables and we're going to then interpret the coefficient of paid attendance. All right. So um, They're asking us to estimate receipts when paid attendance was 200,000 customers attending 30 shows at an average ticket price of $70. Is this likely to be a good prediction. Why or why not. Okay, so this is how this would get laid out here, all right, and um, they've got here, um, your intercept is at minus 18.32, so that's interesting that we would have a negative intercept, all right. Um, the coefficient for paid attendance is 0 0.076, number of shows is 0 0.0070, average uh, ticket price is 0.24, and then um, we've got T ratio here for paid attendance of 126.7, 1.6 for the number of shows, and 61.5 for the um, number of models here. Okay, so we're going to write this out. Before we even talk about this, we're going to write it out into what this regression formula would look like, all right? So we're saying our predicted receipts with this would be minus 18.32 plus 0 0.076 times paid attendance plus 0 0.007 times number of shows plus 0.24 times the average ticket price. All right. So after the number of shows and ticket price are accounted for, an increase of 1,000 customers, if you plug that in, all right, so back here, um, 1,000 customers, um, would generate an average increase of $76,000 in receipts, which makes sense. Okay, so $76 a ticket times 1,000. So estimating receipts when paid attendance was 200,000 customers attending 30 shows at an average ticket price of $70 is 13.89 million. So is this likely to be a good prediction? Um, we have to go back to the R squared, which it doesn't show that the, the R squared on. Oh, yes, it did. Okay, so here's where we would go back to. There's when you're looking at these um, outputs, you're, you're likely going to see this section with the sum of squares and the mean square, etc. at the top with your R squared listed. And then you're going to see this section here with all of this analysis underneath. Now, going back here to look at this R squared, 99.9% is an enormous amount of, uh, of coverage. So that's actually a really good um, coverage. It means that 99.9% .9 of the variability in the price of, um, or I'm sorry, in the uh, predicted receipts is captured by this model. So that's unusually high. 
Okay. Now, um, going back to our home uh, square footage analysis model here, all right? We're gonna look at testing some of the assumptions and conditions, all right? So we've done this with each of our different types of models, and we're just gonna visually look at some example here, uh, examples here to determine how, we, uh, how we're looking here, okay? So the linearity condition, is this satisfied with both bedrooms and living area? Well, we've got a straight line here that you could see pretty clearly, so I would say yes, it is, all right? Um, we're also going to look, we're plotting our residuals here then. Um, we would look for bends or any, or waves or fanning or anything like that. And we don't see anything like that. It's actually pretty linear. So, um, that's pretty good. And then we need to consider the independence assumption. So we can't assure that 100%, but if we think about how our data were collected, we can say was, um, how this data was collected relatively random. Did it introduce any bias? All right, and we're assuming that it was randomly collected in this case. And then the equal variance assumption, we're looking for fanning here. Um, we have a, a pretty equal spread here, so that's good, okay? Now, um, the next thing we're gonna look at here is to see if the distribution of our residuals is um, unimodal and symmetric. Okay, so the tails um, are slightly non-normal here. All right, we've got a long tail off to one side here. So that's an interesting note as well here. Okay, and when we plot this in a histogram and then we see we've got kind of a little bit of a swirl pattern here in the residuals here. So, um, looking at all these conditions, okay, so make sure you check linearity. If that's satisfied, then you can do the multiple regression model, all right? If you have a problem with linearity um, because of just the scale of how things are going, you could consider re-expressing it into a logarithmic scale um, and then and looking at it that way. But, uh, and that, so that's an option if you have like huge spreads in the amount, in, in the numbers in your data, just to refit it to a, a different scale, essentially. Um, plot your residuals and your predicted values, inspect a scatter plot, check for patterns and equal spread, okay? Um, do you expect your data to be independent based on how your data was collected? That's gonna be important. Was randomization used? Are the data representative of a clearly identifiable population? Is autocorrelation an issue? Um, in general, it, it's kind of the same common sense stuff that we have done in our previous chapters, okay? I'm not gonna get super into detail on checking these because if you ever get into research where you're needing to do intense checks, then you're gonna be you know, working on that. This is meant to be sort of a, an introductory course here, okay? So, but being able to recognize if things look nearly normal, is there one hump? Are they relatively um, uh, centrally um, congregated together? Now, um, the next thing that we talk about here in this chapter is gonna be um, testing our model, okay, as far as hypothesis testing goes. So, each of your tests is going to be concerned with whether your parameters, so when you talk about your parameters in your model, we're talking about your slopes your for your various um, x variables and your intercept, if they're actually zero, okay, so is there no relationship where it's zero or is it not zero, okay? And so we do what's called an F test. So I mentioned this earlier, but this is this F test is where we generalize our T test out to cover all of our predictor variables, okay? So you remember from our, our output earlier, we had multiple um, T test numbers for each of the different variables. Now we've got an F test, which is going to 
uh, encompass all of those variables together. So that F test has two degrees of freedom. K is the number of predictors, and then we've got N minus K minus one, where N is our number of observations, okay? So the two key parts there, the number of predictors, K, and the number of observations, N, which we then take N minus K minus one. Now, the F, F test is one-sided, so if you remember what that means, it covers, it takes one half of a normal distribution, essentially. And so, um, bigger F values, like, and if you remember the general premise of a t-test, um, similar to like a z-score, is, is, is it's how far away is it from, um, from your center, right? And the further you are out from your mean, um, then, the fur then the less likely something is to occur. So a bigger F value, a larger yardstick away from your mean, means smaller p-values, lower probability um, that that would occur, okay, um, by chance. So if your null hypothesis um, that there's no relationship is true, then the F will be near one, is, is how this is interpreted, all right? Um, if a multiple regression F test leads to a rejection, okay, so going back to, I'm going to go back and discuss this F score here, all right, more, all right, so if there, if your null hypothesis is true, meaning that there is a very high probability that, um, that your, um, that there's no relationship, then your F will be near one, which means that your uh, probability in that middle will be higher, okay? And when your probability is lower in that F value, then, um, then you have a higher likelihood of a relationship. So if a multiple regression F test leads to a rejection of your null hypothesis, so your null hypothesis being that there is no relationship. If you reject that null hypothesis and you say that there is a relationship, then you would look at the t-test. You'd fall back to the t-test for each coefficient. So your f test tells you if the model um, is, you know, if it, if you have no relationship based on your model or if you do have a relationship based on your model. So you reject that that there's no relationship, then you go and look at each individual predictor value and say, hey, what does your t-test statistic look like, okay? And to calculate those, so your t in the case of n minus k minus 1, which is your degrees of freedom, um, is your b value uh, minus 0 divided by the standard error for that particular um, B, all right? And they say B of J because they're just using a generic J to be like however many, whatever numbered variable this is. So it could be B1 minus zero divided by the standard error for that B1, okay? And then again, that N minus K minus one is your degrees of freedom. So your confidence interval is going to be um, the slope of your predictor variable, right? Whichever variable you're looking at, plus or minus the critical T at your degrees of freedom of N minus K minus one times um, the standard error for that particular predictor variable slope. All right. Now, the standard errors are really just beyond what we can calculate here by ourselves. So we always, in a multiple regression, we are using technology, period, to calculate those. All right, so you're going to go back, you're going to run a multiple regression in the software, which we'll walk through in our in-class exercises here. I'm going to run back to that output example here and you're gonna look for your standard errors for those variables, okay? All right, and um, the meaning of your coefficient 
as we said, it, it's going to vary based on what other predictors you have in your model. So if you switch up what variables you have, then you need to rerun it completely, okay? If we fail to reject our null hypothesis that there's no relationship based for that particular variable, it does not mean that X has no linear relationship to Y. It means that X contributes nothing. So when you fail to reject that there's no relationship, then you're basically accepting that, right? It means that X does not change the modeling of Y when you account for the other predictors, not that there's no relationship. It means that when you have the other predictors involved, that um, that particular X doesn't contribute anything additional, okay? So maybe those other predictors capture um, everything that that particular X already contributes, okay? But if you just had that one by itself, you might have a relationship. Or if you remove some of the other predictor variables, then this X might have a relationship with it, okay? Or might, I should say, might contribute more to the relationship. Okay. In a multiple regression, so each, um, each slope tells us the effect of its predictor variable with y, okay? That coefficient can be different from zero even when there's not a simple linear relationship between the two, okay? So it's possible that your multiple regression slope changes sign also uh, when a new variable will enter the regression, okay? Think about that house example where if you say that there's a fixed number of square feet and then you just keep dividing the number of bedrooms, then you're going to start decreasing the value of your house. All right. So there is that um, to keep in mind. Now going back to our ticket prices again, looking at this same model, we're going to state, okay, what is our hypothesis? Um, what is the test statistic and p-value? And then we're going to draw a conclusion for an f-test for this overall model here, okay? So they have an f-ratio here, 18,634 with a p-value of 0 0.0001, all right? Um, so what is our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that um, um, beta 1 equals beta 2 equals beta 3 equals 0. So that all three of these predictor variables have no um, interrelationship with our y value in this model, okay? Our alternative hypothesis is that beta 1 does not equal 0, beta 2 does not equal 0, or beta 3 does not equal 0. We're not saying and, we're saying that our hypothesis is that one of these variables does or more does not equal zero, all right? So here's the F statistic and the p-value that we had. We're gonna draw a conclusion here. So the p-value is very small, which means that it is highly unlikely that we would have a model like this um, by chance. So at least one of those predictors accounts for enough variation in y um, to be useful and therefore we would reject that there is no relationship there. Okay, now our f ratio suggests that at least one variable is useful. So we're going to go back to our uh, t-tests here, all right, and we're going to look at these to see. Now, the F ratio uh, paid attendance and average ticket price here, if you look at these, all right, paid attendance and average ticket price, um, they both contribute even when all the other variables are in the model, okay? Um, the number of shows is not significant. Look at how much smaller that one is, okay? And um, looks like, oh yeah, and that's our intercept. So that's not when we're, we're just looking at these ones. 
All right. So um, number of shows is not super significant, okay? Um, the p-value is 0.116, which is very large. So we could actually take that and remove our model and then rerun it with just the other two, the paid attendance and the average ticket price. And then we would um, rerun our model to determine if the remaining two predictors are still significant. And then I would be curious because this model currently does capture 99.9% .9 of the variability, what that R uh, squared would do if you were to rerun this. Now, um, looking at our adjusted R square and our F statistics, here's just some summaries of some different um, items that you're going to run into here and what they're, this is just strictly definitions here. Okay. If you see the term SSE, it is the sum of your squared residuals and a larger SSE is going to mean that your residuals are more variable and our predictions are not going to be quite as precise. All right. Um, SSR is the regression sum of squares. A larger SSR means our model accounts for a large portion of the variability in, um, in Y, okay? And then um, the total sum of squares or SST is your SSR plus your SSE, okay? Your total sum of squares is the sum of your squared residuals plus your regression sum of squares which makes sense, all right, if you think about this, because remember, the residuals are the differences between what you calculated the values would be at a particular point and what they actually were, and then the regression sum of squares captures what values were appropriately um, predicted within the model, so what was predicted plus what was outside of those predictions equals the total sum of squares, um, when you think about it holistically like that, it makes sense, all right? Now, um, there's going to be some um, calculations here, too, that you're going to want to keep an eye on, all right? So your R squared, then, um, is going to have, uh, we're just drawing out the relationship here, that um, regression sum of squares divided by your total sum of squares is equal to your R squared, okay? So your sum of squares divided by your total sum of squares, and that's that percentage number that we come up with, all right? It also equals, if you, if you say that 100% of your variability is captured between your um, regression sum of squares and your residuals, if you take one minus your um, sum of squared residuals divided by your total sum of squares, then you get um, the um, sum of squared residuals divided by your total sum of squares. So those two actually, if you think about it, end up equal in one, all right? Um, now, using those expressions, you can state your F factor. You can manually calculate that by taking your R squared divided by K which if you remember K is that number of X variables we had, you divide that by one minus R squared, so what was not captured within your model, divided by your degrees of freedom down here. So testing whether your F is equal to zero is equivalent to testing whether your R squared is equal to zero. So is, the, is what is captured by your model equal to zero? Now, adding new predictor variables to your model um, does not decrease your R squared and almost always will increase it if there is any kind of relationship, okay? But it makes the math much more complex, which is not always a good thing, okay? So think about, you know, the size of your matrix um, being like a three by three versus a four by four, you know, it, it exponentially increases. Um, the number of, of items that you're dealing with. So um, your adjusted R squared imposes kind of a penalty on the correlation strength in larger models. So it depreciates your R squared value um, if you have so many variables that you're actually making it inordinately complex. 
So an, an adjusted R squared um, is equal to one minus one minus your R squared times n minus one divided by n minus k minus one. So um, that just lets you compare between models of different sizes to see, you know, where is the best quote unquote size of model to have. And I'm going to wrap up there. Um, there's a section 15.6 talking about um, the logistic regression model. And I'm not going to get into that. I think it's just, um, you can restate essentially um, data if you say um, yes or no, up or down, and you can put it as like bits and bytes, you know, zero and one in a logical format. That's basically what this is about. Um, and then you can map things out that way. So like if you were to say, if people respond to a sales offer, um, one would be yes and zero would be no. And so you can kind of restate categorical values into numeric values and then use um, quantitative methods to perform some analysis on them. That's generally what is going on um, in these cases. So, um, and then you can use that to come up with um, proportions um, to analyze your results and numeric results, but I'm not going to get into that. I think we've got enough covered here under basic multiple regressions. So I'm going to wrap up on this and um, we will get rolling for um, chapter 15. Thank you for joining me.